Okay, welcome everybody to the next um, Our Changing World Lecture. I'm delighted to see you all here. Um, the Our Changing World Lectures are for students and the wider public on how our researchers in a wide range of disciplines are tackling big global problems. So tonight's lecture is a little unusual in that it's a double act. So in fact you get to hear two distinguished speakers rather than one. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Siddharthan Chandran, and prof uh, who's a professor of neurology, and Professor Charles French Constant, who's a professor of medical um, neurology in the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine. Both are senior clinicians who are working at the cutting edge of clinical research, undertaking research that's likely to influence how we approach and treat a wide variety of diseases in the future. So I hope you're going to enjoy the lecture tonight. I'm particularly looking forward to it, being a developmental biologist. And I'm now going to hand you over to the, both speakers for tonight's lecture, Are Stem Cells the Future of Regenerative Medicine? Thank you very much, Mary, for the introduction. Um, and may I thank uh, Mayank and Gareth um, for the very generous uh, invitation to speak here for, on behalf of myself and Charles. It's a very great pleasure indeed to be able to contribute to this fascinating series of lectures. Um, as you've already heard, this will be a double act. And I hope, as Mary uh, alluded to, that you'll get more than one and you get extra value rather than a dilution of, uh, from both of us speaking. What we want to try and do in the next 45 minutes or so, and there'll be time, I hope, for questions and answers, is really try and convey some of the excitement and enthusiasm in the field of regenerative medicine, which is very much an emerging medical discipline. But at the same time, we want to place that into a sort of societal framework and highlight both the challenges and risks inherent in, in any great new uh, development. Um, and so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to start by uh, trying to contextualize and uh, give you some context about what the unmet clinical need is. As a neurologist, I'll talk about the particular challenges that neurologists face, which is neurodegenerative disorders, but use that very much as a proof of concept to highlight wider problems across the piece of regenerative medicine. And, and I think the, the, uh, the themes will recur, and I hope you'll see that. It's very interesting to me, when putting this together with Charles, that we fall within the framework of a series of lectures which perhaps have captured some of the obvious great challenges in, in the context of a changing world. The perhaps best captured in, in one of the earlier lectures, which was around uh, global challenges and I think the perfect storm. The perfect storm um, sort of captures the collision of aging populations, threats to uh, global security, climate change, sustainability, poverty, food, water, all the rest of it. And in that context, it might be seen that regenerative medicine and stem cells, which is a large amount of what we're going to talk about, is almost seen as a luxury or, or an indulgence. But what I hope we can persuade you that it's quite, it, it, it actually isn't. It can certainly be framed as an indulgence and a privilege, if you like, of the prosperous and the developed world. But I think for several reasons that's not accurate and, and will not be the case in time. And the challenge for us as a community is how to unlock the un, un absolute power of stem cells and to meet and address the very real challenges that people all over the world have. And it may be that the first wave will impact in the developed world, but over time I'd, I'd like to think that its real value will be truly on a global scale. The other point, of course, is what do we mean by the developed world? If I was standing here two decades ago or three decades ago, it's unlikely that the BRIC countries would have featured in the developed world. Yet, right now, the, the great leaders of the West are over in India and China, They're just leaving. So the developed world is a shifting target anyway. And one could even argue, you know, in 200 years' time, will this, will, where we're speaking now, be the developing world? You know, one can never tell. So it's worth putting that into a context. But one of the consequences of prosperity or development is people live longer. <coughs> And, with, and when they enjoy the benefits of living longer, lifestyle changes also emerge. 
and then you, you, you have a series of diseases that will emerge. <coughs> the great challenges, if you like, the public health threats to the modern, in inverted commas, industrialised world are probably heart disease, diabetes and neurodegenerative disorders. I put obesity in brackets intentionally just to highlight the idea between diseases that are the consequence of behaviour or the diseases that are almost inevitable as a consequence of ageing. These are, these are fundamental concepts that we as a society haven't really come to terms with. And if you think you've got it tough now with the social security changes, that's like nothing compared to the future. And we as a, as a community need to understand how we will be able to manage that in an equitable way and deliver something meaningful to all of the people. As you've already heard, I'm a neurologist. And so what I'm going to do is focus on regenerative neurology and the challenges of the damaged brain. But as I've said to you already, I want to use that really as a conceptual theme to return to the same fundamental points about the injured body, in this case, the injured brain, but the principles hold. So the neuro neurodegenerative disorders, of which there are many, uh, are without question one of the major public health threats to this country and certainly to the modern world. And I've listed a few of the obvious uh, diseases, but that list could go on a lot longer. But just those four diseases alone in the UK represent at least 800,000 people suffer with these diseases. And that number is a conservative estimate. Um, most of you would have been touched in some way, directly or indirectly, by the tragedies of each or, or, or at least one of those disorders. And you'll be familiar with the consequences of these diseases, which, which are both personal, family, carers, as well as societal. And what these diseases share, tragically, is that they're all progressive, they're disabling, incurable, and ultimately fatal. So it's a very major challenge. 800,000 is the UK number. You could probably round it up accurately to a million. The global number right now for Alzheimer's disease is estimated to be about 25 million. So you could double that as well. So the numbers are colossal. And their impact is, are huge. And just to give you a sense of both the scale and cost, these two slides I hope will illustrate that. The details don't matter, and this may not project so well at the back. This, the y-axis just represents cost. All you need to know is that the higher up you go, the more it costs. And 25 grand or, or 40,000 is the cost for caring for a, a single individual with these diseases. The diseases that are arrowed are neurological diseases. So, for example, multiple sclerosis costs ballpark 25,000 euros a year. Dementias currently cost 10 to 15,000 a year. Those numbers are likely to escalate as new treatments come online. When new treatments come online, because of the cost of discovery, that will have to be factored in. But if you then do the sums, the current cost in, in purely monetary terms, and this is five, six years ago, is, is huge. And of course, the real burden of, this disease, of these diseases is incalculable. You cannot put a price on the impact it has to the individual and to their loved ones and their families. So this is really just indicative only. And this slide conveys a sense of both the scale of the problem and the reason why the problem will only get worse, because we're all living longer. What this uh, graph shows uh, very powerfully is that Alzheimer's disease is very much an age-related disease, like most neurodegenerative disorders. So in a nutshell, the older you get, the more likely you are to get one of these diseases. And this could not be more powerfully illustrated by, than these three um, bars. Between the age of 60 and 65, that's your risk. Every five years from then on, your risk doubles, such that by the time you're 85, the prevalence of this disease for the 85 year olds is huge, 30%, 40%. And we as a community are living longer. And we're living longer largely not because of doctors, but because of public health advances. But the consequence of, of that, people live longer and, and people therefore age. And we need to understand better what is normal aging and what is diseased aging. So having told you about the scale of the problem, the details in the big picture about neurodegenerative disorders. What is it as a community, and more importantly, what would patients want who have these diseases? Well, as you will all be able to tell me, you'd want three things, really. 
you'd want treatments that will slow the disease, stop it, and the home run ultimately, this is almost therapeutic fantasy right now, but in this audience, let, let us fantasize, would be to develop repairs or treatments that will restore lost function. That will be the ultimate ambition of Regenta Medicine. And in order to even get close to any of those aspirations, we have the need for fundamental new knowledge, new discoveries, which is really we need to understand why the diseases occur and how. And it's through that discovery we might be able to deliver meaningful and targeted treatments. So what I want to do is walk you through the basic fundamentals of some of those diseases. But before doing that, I want to illustrate the core concepts of the brain. Not all of you are neuroscientists. So what I'm going to do is, in two slides, is run you through neuroscience for a, for a novice. So in other words, I'm going to tell you everything I learned at medical school in five years in two slides. And if you went to the medical school I went to, that, that's not going to be so difficult. So the, the brain is essentially uh, it's a very simple structure. At its heart are nerves. And those nerves are surrounded by partner cells, which we tend to call glia or glue. And these cells come in different flavors. One is called the oligodendrocyte. This is the cell that lays down insulation. It's called myelin. You'll hear a lot more about that from Charles, because the loss of myelin is central to the cause of multiple sclerosis. The other cell <coughs> is called an astrocyte. It's represented in this cartoon in blue. And then its other friend, if you like, is the microglia, which is, if you like, the brain immune, med immune cell. Those cells are in the brain and in the spinal cord. They obviously go out and make connections, and they make connections to the muscle. And it, when these cells and muscle work together, they work together in a beautiful electrical circuit, which really is uh, you know, a sort of a wonderfully synchronized um, orchestra, almost, of activity. And as a consequence of that activity, we can move, we can feel, we can think. And indeed, that's the basis of our emotions. But those same building blocks, which when they work in harmony, give you all those functions, are also vulnerable to injury. And if you lose any one of them at any given time, inevitably, you're going to have a problem or you're going to lose a function. So let's just consider three diseases, Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, and multiple sclerosis, which lay out most of the themes. Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder in the world. So the numbers are colossal. In the UK, 120, it's probably 150,000. The point about Parkinson's disease is, like all these diseases, there are no treatments that will stop the disease or reverse the disease. Thankfully, and if any of you do have Parkinson's disease or know anybody with it, you will know that in the early phase of the disease, you know, even up to 10, 15 years, there are a lot of useful treatments that we have which are essentially symptomatic treatments which hold the negative symptoms in check. But we don't have any treatments that will stop or alter the actual natural history of the disease. <coughs> Parkinson's disease is named after James Parkinson, who was an East London physician, who described a patient who had a shaking palsy, which is one of the defining features of this disease, which we now regard as a tremor. It's also famous because, many, because it's so common, many famous people have suffered with this, unfortunately. And one of the most famous sufferers was the late Pope. Without going into the details, and my apologies for any of you who are Parkinson's disease specialists, you, you might want to block your ears at this moment. But this disease is essentially the consequence of the loss of one type of cell in one part of the brain. And that cell is pigmented. And this is what the normal brain looks like when you take a slice around here in the midbrain, and, that, and it's pigmented. And so when you lose it, you have a loss of pigmentation. So this is a patient's brain who had Parkinson's disease. Contrast that with the patient who is well, or an individual. Conceptually, because this disorder is the consequence of the loss of this particular cell, which is called a dopamine cell, it lends itself to the thinking that if you're losing just one cell in one part of the brain, if you can make more of those cells elsewhere, We'll come to that. Perhaps you can treat this disorder by cell replacement or transplantation, which is the classical way that the public tend to conceive of how stem cells might be useful for regenerative medicine. There's certainly some truth in that, but in the context of the damaged brain, that's probably overplayed. So now this is motor neuron disease, and we have a particular interest in motor neuron disease in Edinburgh, 
because as you heard from Mary, there's been a major development as, uh, as a consequence of the generosity of the McDonald family, which is called the Ewan McDonald Center. And this is a center that works in partnership nationally and internationally uh, in the area of motor neuron disease. In the US, this disorder is actually often called Lou Gehrig disease after this famous baseball player who died in his prime with this disorder. It's also called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which captures the, the three core features of this disorder. The key take-home messages are, this is a really terrible disorder, it's devastating. And the tragedy of this disease is both its rapidity, by and large people um, from the point of diagnosis are wheelchair bound within one to two years, and unfortunately frequently are dead within three to five years. There are no treatments that will meaningfully stop this disorder. And this disorder represents um, a problem between the nerve and the muscle. But as with everything, just as in life, the environment matters. So the cellular environment also has a role in manifesting this disease, but also potentially might be a target ultimately for how you might repair this disorder. So the disease is essentially a breakdown in the communication between the nerve and muscle, which manifests ultimately in loss of those nerves that supply muscle. Now, multiple sclerosis is another disease that we're very familiar with. It's, we're particularly familiar with that in Scotland because for, for reasons that I won't uh, discuss unless it comes up in questions, Scotland has the unenviable um, recognition of being the global capital of this disorder. There are more patients per capita pretty much in Scotland than there are anywhere else in the world with multiple sclerosis. And there are many reasons why that may be the case. This disorder is unusual compared to the ones I've discussed already in that its onset tends to be in the younger population and it tends to have a female prominence initially. And this is uh, a picture of Jacqueline Dupre who again was struck in her prime with this disease, a particularly malignant or nasty form such that she died um, from this early on in her life. This disorder, as I've uh, alluded to already, is a problem not just of the nerve, but crucially of that, uh, of the insulation or the myelin. And you'll hear more about this. But in a nutshell, this disorder results in loss of myelin. And you, so you get non-insulated or vulnerable naked nerves. And those nerves are then destined to die with time. And that's called progression. So thus far, this is a pretty gloomy tale, right? I've told you that this is a huge problem. It's going to get worse because we're living longer and that you've got all these diseases, and there's very little we can do for them, and yet you're all, anybody who's got them is going to die. So it is very gloomy and bleak, but I think there is hope on the horizon. And in a sense, I want to illustrate that by considering the myth of Prometheus. So this, for, and I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, will be familiar with this tale from Greek mythology. This captures very much, um, in, in many ways, sort of anticipates and predicts where we are now or where we think we might be. So this is the tale of Prometheus, a titan, who was punished. And the punishment was, was particularly cruel because the punishment resulted in Prometheus being chained, um, chained uh, to a rock or to a mountain face and having to suffer um, his liver being devoured by the eagle. Now that's bad enough. But the particular cruelty is that punishment was a daily punishment because the liver can repair itself or regenerate. So in a sense, whoever came up with this anticipated and predicted what stem cells are about, about the capacity to regenerate, albeit in a rather bizarre way it's represented here. And this slide illustrates this, um, how legend can sometimes become reality. The, there's nothing random in the liver being chosen because the liver is the archetypal organ that has innate capacity to repair itself. And it can repair itself because it's full of liver stem cells. And this is illustrated here. So here is a stem cell. And what happens here in the context of injury, injury could be any of these, typically alcohol, <coughs> viral infections, doesn't matter, cirrhosis. So here you have an injured liver, now you've got the hole. And here's your stem cell also within the liver architecture. And over time, the liver stem cell, just like any stem cell, can do two things. It can give rise to more of itself, so it can self-renew, but it can also give rise 
to specialized progeny. In this case, a liver stem cell will make more of itself, but it will also make new liver cells and hence, and hence replace the damaged cells. So it captures what the wider uh, challenge or promise of stem cell medicine might be. The idea that you've got a cell that can re replace itself plus make the specialized cells that are lost in injury. So against this background, uh, the key message I'd want to convey is that human stem cells, which are very much here and now, as, as, uh, as we will discuss, represent a fantastic experimental opportunity for medicine. They also potentially have direct therapeutic opportunities. They're therapeutic opportunities directly for neurological disorders. As I've said already, it's probably overplayed, but we can return to that. I'm just going to now wrap through and discuss some of the experimental opportunities and then set up the stage for Charles to discuss therapeutic activities around promoting the brain's own stem cells to do the job in the context of injury. So what sort of stem cells are there? Now, because we're dealing with human disorders and human diseases, we're going to focus very much on human stem cells. Human stem cells, like all stem cells, come in different flavors. But one of the ways that they're often categorized is as a function of development. So you've got the early stem cell, the mother of stem cells, if you like, which is the embryonic stem cell. Now, this stem cell emerges um, from the um, following um, fertilization. And uh, typically, it's taken from, in the human context, from a immature a blastocyst at the stage of which the early conceptus is a two-layered structure. And the inner cells from that, from that two-layered structure each has the capacity to be a master stem cell. In other words, it has the capacity to make all the cells and all the organs that make the body. So the ultimate, if you like, body repair kit. Then there are more specialized stem cells which exist in different organs. The liver has its own stem cell, the skin, <coughs> bone, blood, brain even. And then there's this other business which is called the adult stem cell, which I'll come back to in a moment. Just to show you how fast this field is moving, th these are some timelines. So 1981 is when mouse embryonic stem cell, M for mouse, were first isolated. 1981, it's not that long ago in the context of science. And those discoveries led to a Nobel Prize for three people, one of which was Sir Martin Evans. And that was work done in Cambridge. He's now in Cardiff. Human embryonic stem cells, the human correlate, if you like, of mouse embryonic stem cells, first isolated in 1998 in Madison by Jamie Thompson. And then this stem cell, which is called the Human Induced Pluripotent Stem Cell, or IPS, is 2008, though the, the conceptual basis of that probably occurred, well, definitely occurred over three or four decades previous to that. And the, one of the fundamental conceptual bases for the induced pluripotent stem cell is this. And this, you'll be familiar with, is Dolly the Sheep. And Dolly the Sheep is a very sort of Scottish creation, came out of Roslyn, and the work led by Sir Ian Wilmot. And what Dolly the Sheep conveys and builds on earlier work from uh, John Gurdon and other colleagues three, four decades earlier, is the idea that every cell in the body can be reprogrammed into a master stem cell. The details don't matter. But you can conceive of taking a cell from your skin or any other organ, breast tissue, and you can convert that using various techniques and technologies into the master stem cell. And that adult cell going into a master stem cell we call reprogramming. And the human-induced pluripotent stem cell revolution, and I think revolution, which I use advisedly, is correct, has, at a stroke, nicely sort of sidestepped some of the ethical dilemmas that were confronting the field around embryonic stem cells and issues around cloning and the use of human uh, ovaries or eggs, oocytes, I should say, for reprogramming. The consequence of reprogramming technologies captured in human-induced pluripotent stem cells is simply this. You can now conceive of the reality that any one of you can generate your own master stem cells called a pluripotent stem cells. And it's done very simply. We can take a, a tiny skin biopsy, but it need not be a skin biopsy, you can pluck a hair. 
And from that hair, you can generate cells which are called fibroblasts, and these will grow like weeds. Those fibroblasts can then be subjected to proteins or genes, and, these are, and the developments in these are unbelievably rapid. The classic cocktail is four factors. So you take your skin, you generate these fibroblasts, you apply <coughs> these factors, and you then convert them into this master stem cell, which we called an induced pluripotent stem cell, which has some very great similarities with the embryonic stem cell. You can then convert that into neural stem cells, so now these are into brain stem cells. That's the area that we work in. And then those brain stem cells can be converted into whichever cell type you're interested in. So if you're interested in motor neuron disease, you'd be interested in switching these into motor nerves. If you take that to its logical extension, you can make those nerve cells that are appropriate to the disease you're interested in. So if you're interested in Parkinson's, you might want to make the midbrain dopaminergic cell, which, is, which I've referenced already. If you're interested in multiple sclerosis, you might want to make the cell that lays down the myelin or the insulating sheath, called the oligodendrocyte. If you're interested in motor neuron disease, and so on and so forth. The power of this system, as you might imagine, because the stem cells by definition can grow to scale, you can generate unlimited numbers of personalized, <coughs> if you want, cells that carry the genetic material of that individual. But you can also scale this to such an uh, order that for drug companies and for other researchers, you now have a fantastic resource for modeling the disease, what we call modeling disease in a dish, but also you have the ultimate assay for screening drugs, for discovering drugs and testing drugs. And that's one of the very major advances that I think will make its way through medicine in the next 10, 20 years. So I'm going to pause at that point and hand over to Charles. Okay, so I'd like to um, change gears slightly now and think not about how we can use stem cells to discover um, about diseases, but whether we can actually use them to directly treat those diseases. And there are two approaches that I want to highlight to you, two broad strategies we can use. One which I would call exogenous treatment is where we take stem cells and we grow them up in large numbers in a dish, we turn them into the cell type that we're interested in, and then we introduce them back into the body. In this case, we would actually transplant them into the brain and we would effectively perform a cell replacement strategy. So Siddharthan's told you that Parkinson's disease is a, a disease of groups of neurons in a very specific place, and there have been some very successful studies showing that transplantation um, to replace those neurons can be successful. The other approach, though, is to actually take advantage of the fact, and I'll tell you more about this, that the body has plenty of its own stem cells in many tissues. And if we can devise drug treatments that would actually promote the activity of those cells, then we should be able to repair tissues by what you would call an endogenous mechanism, by using the, bo the, the body's, and, or in this case the brain's, own inherent um, repair mechanisms. And in order to illustrate these two different strategies, which can be applied to many different tissues and many different diseases, I want to just talk about one disease, multiple sclerosis, because it does provide a very nice illustration of the sort of research you need to do to address this problem. So Siddharthan's already introduced you to multiple sclerosis. It's a disease where the myelin sheaths around the nerve fibers are lost and they're destroyed by a process of inflammation and this causes the relapses and remissions that you see early on in the disease. It's what happens next that we need to think about though. In many cases, particularly early on in the disease, the myelin is repaired very efficiently within the brain by a process called remyelination. However, at some stage, in most patients, this process will fail and the axons become chronically demyelinated and those axons then degenerate. The axons seem to require myelin in order to stay healthy. And it's that loss of the axons that actually causes the progressive nature of multiple sclerosis. 
And this is a neurodegenerative disease, as Siddhartha's told you, because the progressive phase of multiple sclerosis is caused by degeneration of axons. And the two phases can happen at the same time in the same brain. So this is a slice of a brain, a patient who died of multiple sclerosis, and you can see here the myelin has been stained in blue. This is the whole half of a brain, so this is a fairly big slice of tissue. And you can see with the green arrows, three white areas in that tissue. Those are areas where the myelin has been lost and has not been replaced. However, if you look at the red arrowed areas, you can see two smaller lesions, which are light blue. And they're light blue because the myelin has been almost completely repaired in those areas of damage. So you can get areas that don't repair and areas that do repair occurring side by side. Now, obviously what we want to do is we want to repair those areas that have not repaired themselves, and I've said to you there are two ways we might go about this. One is by transplanting in new stem cells, and the other is by activating stem cells in the brain. And what I want to do in the next five minutes is just take you through the sort of research that one needs to do in order to develop those two methods. So let's think first about how we might go about developing a strategy to transplant cells into the brain. What do we need to be able to do? Well, we need to be able to show first that we can grow very large numbers of stem cells and turn them into the cell types we need to replace myelin, in this case, the oligodendrocyte. And then we need to show, in an animal model, that the strategy will work. And I want to show you both of those. So. This is actually um, some work from Siddhartha's lab, and this basically makes the point that you can grow very large numbers of stem cells in a dish. So here we have the um, embryonic stem cells that we start with, and if you culture them under the correct conditions, they will turn into the neural stem cells that we need to start the process of getting cells for treating neurological diseases. And if you look at day 8 and day 16, you can see that these clumps of cells are growing much larger. And if you look at the, with markers to actually mark stem cells in green or neural stem cells in red, you can see that the starting population, which was a stem cell population, an embryonic stem cell population, has turned very much into brain stem cells. And now if you count the numbers of cells that you're generating and look over 100 days, and this is a logarithmic scale on the y-axis, you can see that you can get a massive increase in the number of cells. So growing the cells that we need is no problem. So the next question is, will they work? And many people have shown that this is a feasible approach. But the experiments I want to tell you about tonight were done in a laboratory in the United States in Rochester by Stephen Goldman and his colleagues. And I think they're the best illustration of just how powerful this approach might be. So what Stephen and his colleagues did, particularly Martha Windrum, is they used an, a mouse that lacks normal myelin. Now, this is a mouse that is, has a, a naturally occurring mutation, and it's called shiverer because of the shivering behavior that the mouse has as a result of the loss of myelin. Now, there are many human diseases that result from abnormalities of myelin, just like this mouse. We call them leukodystrophies. So this is a perfectly good model of a human disease. Because it doesn't make its own myelin, if you transplant cells into it and they form myelin, you can measure that simply by looking for the presence of normal myelin, because you know it must have come from the transplanted cells. And you can see that here. Myelin is in red, and the nerve fibers are in green, and the human cells, because this is human cells transplanted into a mouse, are blue. And you can see that the blue cells here have produced plenty of red myelin. So this approach will work. Human stem cells transplanted into a brain that does not have myelin will form myelin. How effective can this be? Well, the answer is it can be dramatically effective. So these are sections of the whole brains of these mice. And the, this is, about the, in red here, we have a stain for the human cells. And in green, we have a stain for the myelin. 
And what's happened here is that the brains of these mice have been entirely myelinated by human cells. Because if I showed you a section of a normal mouse brain with normal myelin, you would not be able to tell the difference between the distribution of that myelin and the distribution of the green myelin I've showed you there. But perhaps the most powerful illustration of this is that just like children with leukodystrophies, many of these mice will die young because of the myelin disorder. But in some cases, mice treated like this will live an apparently normal lifespan. So this has effectively completely replaced the myelin in the brain of the mouse. So this shows that this approach will work. But then the next question you have to ask yourself is, well, do we actually need to do this? Because we know that in patients with multiple sclerosis, some of them can repair their lesions perfectly normally. So that would suggest that there are stem cells there already. Is this the case in all MS lesions? So in order to do that, we have to go back and do some developmental biology, which, as you've heard, is what, what I particularly enjoy doing. And we grow stem cells in a dish, and we turn them into oligodendrocytes. And these, these, actually, these are cells I grew, in fact, when I was a PhD student. You can see the stem cells at the top here turning into these beautiful cells, oligodendrocytes. They really are the most lovely cells to work with. And then you use antibodies to label the cells, and you can identify antibodies which will label stem cells. So now what you do, and this was actually done by colleagues in, in America, Bruce Trapp, um, what you can do is you can take those antibodies and put them on sections of brains for patients with multiple sclerosis and ask whether there are stem cells there. And the answer is very surprising. All of those black arrows point to stem cells in a multiple sclerosis lesion that is not repairing. So that tells you something very important. It tells you that the problem is likely to be in this lesion, not that there is a lack of stem cells, but that the stem cells that are there can't contribute to the repair process, which would suggest to me that transplantation is not the way to go in multiple sclerosis, because in many cases the brain has the stem cells it needs already. What we've got to do is we've got to find ways of activating the stem cells that are already there. Now, just to go back to the point that Siddhartha made about there being different flavours of stem cells, I just want to emphasise that what we're talking about now is an adult tissue stem cell. These are stem cells present in the adult brain. They're quite different in flavour to the embryonic stem cells that you can grow from early embryos. These are cells that seem to be restricted to forming the different cell types of the brain. But nonetheless, they are stem cells in that they have the classic stem cell ability to divide indefinitely and to repair tissue, just as those liver stem cells were doing for poor Prometheus. So, why do we have stem cells in the brain? Did evolution put them there so that we could repair our brains? I doubt it. I think it's much more likely, and there's good evidence to suggest, that the reasons we have stem cells in our brain is because they're an important part of turnover in the brain. And that the evidence would suggest that learning and memory might actually require the continual generation of new neurons to replace those that are lost. And there are some beautiful examples of this in nature, but the one I particularly like, being a Norwich City football fan, is the canary. So the adult male canary is a very beautiful bird, as you can see. And unlike Norwich City football fans, it learns a new song every year. And that song is very important to it because that's how female canaries choose their mate. And what happens in the male canary brain is that every autumn, some of the neurons involved in song generation are lost, they die, and every spring, the stem cells activate, generate new neurons, which wire into the circuit, and the male canary learns a new song. 
Now, fortunately, mate selection in human is not determined by how well males could sing. Things might be very different if that was the case. But the basic mechanisms of neural replacement involved in complex behavior patterns are probably correct. And that's why we have stem cells in our brain. But we can also, we think, use them to promote repair. Now, I'm oversimplifying greatly here. There are many different types of stem cells in the brain. And I don't want you to think that the stem cells that we're looking at in MS are exactly the same as the stem cells that might be involved in learning and memory. There will be important differences. But nonetheless, the basic generality is true. The brain contains abundant stem cells. So how can we actually activate these stem cells? And so this was a problem that um, ourselves here in Edinburgh and our sister centre in Cambridge, headed by Robin Franklin, who's the long-standing colleague of Siddhartha and I, set out to address. And what we did is we basically generated in the rat brain a um, tiny little lesion in, the cerebe in, a, in a part of the brain just underneath the cerebellum which will repair itself naturally, a little demyelinated lesion which will repair itself naturally. And this is, in fact, an area of the brain that's often involved in multiple sclerosis. So this was a very good model. So you inject a very small amount of a toxin against myelin into this uh, caudal cerebellar peduncle, it's called, and that generates a little area of demyelination that will heal itself perfectly naturally by stem cell-mediated repair over the next two to three weeks. And then you simply ask the question, well, what are the genes that are expressed during that repair process? And can we use that knowledge to identify new targets for drugs that will promote endogenous repair? Now, the way you actually do this, I think, is quite clever. You cut sections of the brain, and then you use a laser to cut out around the lesion. So you can see the lesion area here, which is slightly more purple than the surrounding tissue. And it's simply being cut out with a laser. And then the little bits of tissue, and they are tiny. This is all done down a microscope, are, are collected into a tube and the gene expression analyzed in, that, in those little bits of tissue. And in that way, we have been able to identify an exciting new target that we hope will lead to a potential new drug for multiple sclerosis, but that's many years down the line at this stage. The point I want to make is that by studying natural regenerative processes, we can find new ways of treating, uh, potentially treating disease. So that's what I wanted to say about multiple sclerosis. I've used it as an example about how you might uh, go to, for a cell transplantation strategy. Then, to some extent, I've destroyed my own argument by showing you that I don't think transplantation is probably the way to go in multiple sclerosis. And then I've illustrated how you might activate the brain's own stem cells. So what I want to do now, just to close, because I'm very keen that we leave times for questions and answers, or although I suspect it'll just turn out to be questions and more questions, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to end by focusing for just for a short time on the challenges of, of stem cell medicine. What we've done thus far is we've presented the opportunity and the excitement, and we may have left you with the impression that this is all fine, this is all easy, there are no problems. But you'll know that that's not the case. The science is extremely difficult. And in addition, it seems to me that there are some interesting challenges posed by stem cell medicine that I just wanted to talk about. And I think we could split them into three groups. There's challenges to society, challenges to groups of patients, and challenges to individuals. So let's just think about those. To society. I think if we'd given this lecture a few years ago, we would have said the main challenge was around the ethical issues associated with embryonic stem cells. Now, I know many of you have thought very hard about these ethical issues, and I'm not going to go in them today, but there are clearly very real ethical questions that need to be asked, and I think they can be answered, but they still need to be asked, about obtaining stem cells from human embryos. But of course, Induced pluripotent cells that Siddhartha told you about, I think, goes a very long way to sidestepping that, because now we can make stem cells from many different cell types in the body, as, as Siddhartha told you. The other thing, the other point, and again, Siddhartha mentioned this, is the cost. This is not a cheap form of medicine. 
And I would argue that this is very much going to be an application for the developed world for the foreseeable future. And I think that one of the challenges is for healthcare provision is going to be, if this form of medicine takes off, is meeting the very substantial costs that are involved. Now, what about challenges to patient groups? This might seem an odd uh, title, if you like, but I think I'm, there's a very real point I'm trying to make here, which is about hype and stem cell tourism. So there's an awful lot of hype about stem cell medicine. But this hype hasn't arisen because anybody's telling mistruths. I think the hype has arisen because we have two groups. We have groups of patients with degenerative diseases for which there is currently no effective treatment. And then we have scientists working hard to try to develop treatments for these patients. But scientists have to get their work funded, and in order to do that, they have to present the potential and the possible applications of their work to the funders. But those messages are being heard by patients who, I think, find it difficult to tease out the, from the scientists the complexities and the challenges and the very large gap between what the scientists have on offer and what would be required to treat a patient. Pharmaceutical companies know how big that gap is very well. They know there's 10 to 15 years' work in that gap. But sometimes that is not got across to patients. And there are unscrupulous individuals out there who take advantage of the fact that sometimes that gap is not perceived and are happy to take significant amounts of money from patients for so-called stem cell treatments, which really have little or no possibility of working because the science simply isn't there. And cells are being given that will either be rejected immediately by the body's immune system or for which there's no, be no, no um, evidence whatsoever that there would be any benefit. And it's good to see that, fi I think, finally, some of the individuals involved are being called to account. And this was a recent high-profile case about a doctor in Holland who was treating patients with multiple sclerosis with a treatment which the GMC found, I think, was very clearly had no realistic hope of benefit and was taking large amounts of money and raising quite unrealistic expectations. So I think this is one of the challenges, and, and there is a real danger, I think, that um, a few high-profile trials of stem cells that fail to work will disillusion the public. The scientists might feel that the trials have been successful in that they turned out to be safe, but I think the public have a much higher expectation of this form of medicine. And I think there's a danger that the, that expectation will turn against us if it's not met. Finally, like any medicines, you have to ask the questions, will it work and is it safe? And stem cell medicines are no different. I've already talked about will it work, but finally I just want to talk a little bit about safety. And this is important for stem cells because stem cells, as you've heard, have the capacity to grow throughout life. So they have the capacity to form tumours because, of course, that's what a tumour is. It's cells dividing when they shouldn't do so. And in fact, there is a school of thought, that I think a very important school of thought, that many normal cancers are, in fact, ca cancers caused by abnormal stem cells. So a conventional view of a cancer would be that you have a single cell type that divides very rapidly, and if you treat that, those rapidly dividing cells with a cytotoxic drug that kills rapidly dividing cells, all will be well. An alternative view, and there's good evidence for this in the brain, that what's actually happening in cancer is you have a cancer stem cell which is actually dividing very slowly, but it's giving rise to cells that are dividing very quickly. Those quickly dividing cells form the bulk of the tumour, but they are not the root of the cancer. The root of the cancer is this slowly dividing cell, which will not, of course, be effectively treated by cytotoxic therapies. So this is an important theory, and, of course, it raises the question about if we transplant stem cells, is there a potential danger of causing tumours? 
Well, thankfully, such cases are extremely rare, but there has one recently documented example of a Russian patient who was transplanted with neural stem cells, who did develop tumors that clearly derive from those stem cells. So like any treatment, stem cells will have risks if they have benefits. And it's very important not to lose sight of that in all of the excitement around stem cell medicine. So just to end then, what have we told you? Well, we've told you that degenerative diseases represent a major challenge to the developed world. The social and economic costs are vast. We've told you that regenerative medicine offers real hope for treatments. These are diseases for which there are currently no other therapies. In many diseases, there are no other therapies. We've explained, I hope, how rapid advances in stem cell medicine and stem cell biology underpin regenerative medicine and are providing us with new ways of thinking about treating these diseases. And these advances really provide us with approaches that were inconceivable a decade ago. Induced pluripotent cells were really, we could not have imagined that you could turn a skin stem cell, a skin cell into a stem cell 10 years ago. As Siddhartha said, some of the biology was there, but the actual reality was still a long way off. But as I wanted to just end with, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that like any exciting and rapidly advancing technology, stem cells offer us significant challenges as well as the enormous benefits. So thanks very much, and I hope you have some questions. Thanks very much. Can we? Um, that was fantastic. I think it was a really good balance between all the potential, um, but just reminding people of the um, possible risks as well. So, who'd like to start the questions? Okay. Um, I've got motor neuron disease, and one of my questions is that there seem to be so many people in the world actually looking for a cure for this disease. And my question is, is it the drug companies that are controlling everything? Um, you know, the sci uh, it's always the complaint that scientists don't have enough money. Now that you've got 10 million from J.K. Rowling, um, can you just answer me why are all these people and no one comes up with an answer? Is it because of lack of money or what are the other reasons? All these people in the United States are looking at MS, MND, etc. You've got a big center here. Okay, it's difficult, but there must be your bright people. Why is it so slow? And is it the drug companies that's controlling everything? Um. <coughs> In a sense, you articulate what um, many people think and, and ask. I think that the reality is, if I could take your question in several parts, first of all, I don't think it is the drug companies. I think that would be an oversimplistic interpretation. The, the truth is the challenges of biology and the complexity of the brain are such that despite the great advances we've touched upon, we simply don't have enough knowledge. And it might sound terribly sophisticated, but our knowledge compared to the complexity of the brain remains very crude. And in fact, most of the tools that we use to interrogate the brain in health and in injury are very, very blunt. So I think the, re the, the tragedy is the brain and its design and its complexity is way ahead of where we are in knowledge. However, um, there have been great advan advances in the last decade, two decades. Um, investments of targeted philanthropy that you allude to, I think, will m make a difference. But the, the, the truth is, uh, Caroline, and as a neurologist, I say this with a sort of heavy heart because I see patients, is we cannot get treatments out quick enough. But equally, I'm very sensitive to the need to manage expectation sensitively because patients, as you well aware and understand better than I do, are a vulnerable group. And the easiest thing to do, but the, the most incorrect thing to do, is to offer false promises which we can't deliver on. My hope is that over time, 10, 15 years, that we will make meaningful advances. Many 
thanks for your lecture. Uh, I understand that maybe one big issue is to to put the, the the neurons in the in a good place. That is related with the extracellular matrix or something like that. Like for example, we have extracellular matrix in in lungs, in the heart. I mean. So the question you're asking is... Uh, How to place the neurons in the, in the right place. Right. So you, there's, a, you, there's a couple of very important points you've raised. One is that um, you, you, there's no point transplanting cells in the wrong place. They have to be put where they need to end up. But even if they're put where they need to end up, they need to be able to do two things. They need to be able to survive, and they need to be able to connect up properly. And those are both major challenges for us at the moment. We know that the majority of transplanted cells will not survive, and we know, just as you've said, that extracellular matrix is a critical signal that keeps cells alive. So finding the right extracellular matrix is important. But even if you've done that, you have to devise strategies for getting the cells to wire up. So with Parkinson's disease, for example, where there's quite an extensive experience of transplantation. We still don't know for sure that those cells are actually wiring up properly. It could just be that they're producing enough of the substance which is missing, dopamine, to actually um, affect and, and help the cells around them. Um, I just wonder if you could comment on why MS prevalence in Scotland is so high. You alluded yeah. to your yeah, sure. There's about 10,500 in Scotland. And in fact, uh, in the UK, there's a, there's a very sharp uh, north-south gradient. So as you move, for example, from London up through, through the country, uh, the numbers increase. For example, London, ballpark, 120, 130 per 100,000. Uh, um, and by the time you get to Edinburgh and Lothian, you're probably about 150, 160 go up to Aberdeen, 170, 180. So those really are sharp divides. Um, the, th what, what we understand is that the further you are away from the equator, in a sense, the more of it there is about. So the question is why? People, that leads to people to think about sunlight. Sunlight leads people to think about vitamin D. That's one idea. Th these aren't new. But also whether there are particular germs or bugs around which are more prevalent here. The truth is we don't know, but there has to be a major clue there. If you, if you know the answer, do, do come and tell us. And of course, the other thing that points to that is that if you go down the east coast of Australia, you have exactly the opposite effect. It's much more common in Tasmania than it is up at the top. The same principle. Yeah. Which I think rules out the Vikings. <coughs> Um, you explained how the stem cells can hopefully affect um, a repair, but it, presumably they will not do anything for the underlying process that's, that's causing the problem in the first place. Is that right? So it may prolong um, a period of recovery, but unless there are other treatments, the process is going to come back, isn't it? Do you want to stop yeah. with that one? Well, no. I mean... So I guess you're right. Um, the future for, for these diseases is combinatorial treatments. So treatments that will stop the disease and then treatments that will restore loss function. So you could conceive of stem cells as a treatment that might restore loss function, it might enable repair. But actually through other mechanisms that we didn't really discuss, you could consider how stem cells could either be a, almost a cellular Trojan horse that can deliver therapeutics in a targeted fashion and in that way could stop the disease as well as prevent, uh, as well as repair. So um, this is capturing the idea of what people sometimes call stem cell or therapeutic plasticity. But your, the fundamental question you raise is correct. The future is tailoring treatments to the individual and to the stage of the disease, which might need treatments that slow the disease, stop the disease, as well as reverse the disease. So just to 
let's talk specifically about multiple sclerosis, the vision would be that a patient in the clinic would be taking drugs to um, protect, to, to damp down the inflammation that causes the damage and drugs to promote the regeneration at the same time. And I think the, the, these, the, the multiple drugs that will be required will be an important way forward for regenerative medicine. Hi, you spoke uh, <clears throat> briefly about the, the costs, and I think you impacted on everyone that that is a major issue. To what extent have you, in establishing Edinburgh in the way that you have as a center of regenerative medicine research, established connections in those other parts of the world where similar research is going on so that whatever money is available is efficaciously used and the results are shared? So. Professor Wilmot and our centre director are in China at the moment doing exactly that. Um, we're working very hard to establish um, interactions not only with the colleagues in America and Europe that, that we have just as part of the normal scientific process, but also in parts of the world where I think that um, much more money and many more resources will become available in the near future, so China and India. And... Um, there's not only big politicians out there at the moment in China at the moment, there's the scientists are there as well. And we're trying to set up a, a, a sister stem cell institute in China. And in this respect, Edinburgh has a significant role to play, does it? Well, yes, no. If, if this were to come to pass, that this, this would be very much a, a joint venture. Why don't stem cells age the same way that neurons age, for example? And as I get older, if, for example, I wanted to take a skin cell and turn it back into a stem cell using the technology you were talking about uh, to make a neuron, why wouldn't I just get an old neuron from an old skin cell? So there's an interesting question. Right. <laughs> stem cells do age. We know that the repair process is much less efficient in an older animal than it is in a younger animal, okay? And some very nice experiments have been done in America on mice joining together young and old animals um, in it's what's called parabiosis. And then you can show that you can actually rejuvenate the old stem cells in the old animal by them being physically joined to a young animal. So there is very good evidence that stem cells will age and equally good evidence that that process can be reversed. So obviously the chase is now on to discover what are the molecular mechanisms by which ageing is determined and what are the signals that can actually control that ageing. I have two questions. Um, what do you think about hyperbaric oxygen therapy for multiple sclerosis and um, the rewiring of the canary's brain? So, um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Um, for those of people who don't know, hyperbaric oxygen has, uh, said in the UK over two or three decades, um, been um, considered by some to be useful for patients with multiple sclerosis, am amongst other disorders, and it's, uh, indeed some MS societies branches have funded this. The evidence base uh, that hyperbaric oxygen makes a difference to the underlying disease and disability is limited. So my own view would be that hyperbaric oxygen doesn't have any demonstrable, consistent evidence that it's useful. Um, you mentioned rewiring the canary's brain. Yeah. Um, when you had the new song, I mean, it does one every year, was there a specific part of the brain that was rewired? Which part was it? 
<laughs> there are people in this audience who know a lot more about this than I do, so I have to be careful. But yes, there are areas of the brain uh, that are very much involved in song generation. And I mean, I oversimplified enormously, but the, what happens is that it, each autumn, if you like, the basic skeleton is left behind, and then the new neurons come in and build on that. But yes, this is happening in very specific parts of the brain. And that also seems to be true in the human brain. There are parts Parts of the human brain where turnover is occurring very naturally, areas involved in learning and memory. And then there are other parts of the brain that basically don't seem to change much. You know, you, you die with what you're born with. So it would, it's important to realize that different regions of the brain behave very differently. We, we only use a third of our brain. There's two thirds there that are still unused. Yeah, I'm cynical enough to think that's just because we don't know how to measure the activity of the two-thirds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, that's obviously stimulated a load of new questions, so one over here. I was quite fascinated by your idea, the hint of a spectrum between cancer, which is uncontrolled reproduction, and uh, degenerative disease, which is inadequate replacement of cells. And uh, it makes it sound a bit like a spectrum. Or it, um, Do you have any relationship with people who are studying cancer to uh, understand the same mechanisms of cell reproduction? Yes, definitely. I mean, of course, the, smart, the smartest research is, is don't rediscover what's already known. And so the cancer biology field is, of course, huge. And uh, as Charles has said, and most people in this room will be familiar with, that's about unregulated division. And stem cells is, if, if you like, about regulated and controlled division. And a lot of the insights that we have today in the stem cell field, which remains young, are borrowed from cancer biology. But within Edinburgh, for example, there are increasing links between cancer biology and stem cell biology. And in the true spirit of sort of interdisciplinary research, we, we need to sort of even remove some of those um, prefixes and just study cell division. Just very quick. Um, other than lots of extra money, what what do you need as a as a scientific community to make real progress? <laughs> Charles is keen to answer that. <laughs> I think what we need is, um, I mean, we obviously do need extra money because science is very technology driven and technology is increasingly expensive. Um, and I mean, whilst we don't need super colliders, we do need seriously expensive bits of equipment to look deeper and deeper into the brain. I mean, just to give you an example, I, I haven't forgotten the question but just to give you an example one thing we really would love to do is to be able to actually watch stem cells in the brain turning into neurons and then actually wiring up now you can do this but the technology is very sophisticated and expensive but I think the other thing that we need is we need more bright young people I mean fundamentally the problem is the number of minds working on the issue. And one of the reasons why we so appreciate the donations we get of any size is that they enable us to address the question of sustainability. What we have to do is we have to make sure that we're training the graduate students and postdocs in this area of medicine so that we can build up the necessary critical mass that we need. And I, I think at the moment, you know, it might seem strange to say it, but at the moment there just aren't enough people working on the various problems around stem cell biology. And, and I think that's what we have to build. But you can't, those people can't be sort of made. They, we have to train them. Oh no, start a school. I mean, I got interested in regenerative biology because I cut the heads off flatworms at school and they regrew. And I'll never forget that experiment. 
I cut the end off my finger and it didn't regrow. <laughs> and you ask yourself the question, well, what's the difference between my finger and the flatworm? Age, and, age. And that's, no, 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 it's got nothing to do with age. <laughs> and that's one of the fundamental questions of biology still. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One is, no way you're saying about using the stem cells already there for repair. Have you got any ideas of how that would actually be done? Um, yeah, so we'll talk about the brain in a moment, but stem cells and their use in medicine has a long history of success. So using stem cells that are in the blood to treat cancers of the blood has been going on for about 40 years. That's established treatment. How might you use stem cells in the brain to do something useful? That isn't yet um, in clinical practice, but some of the work that Charles discussed is about developing drugs in the dish which can then promote the stem cells that are in the brain. So the field is really looking to develop druggable targets that can wake up, rejuvenate existing brain stem cells to go to those parts that are injured. But that's ahead of us. Yeah. Um, my other question was, no stem cells. How many groups of animals have it? How many groups of life have it? Is it just animals? Or do plants and fungi, yeah. stuff like that have them These as well? are terrific questions. And I'm, I'm delighted you're in this audience because this gets back to what Charles said. It's people like you who need to sort this all out. Um, and just to help you on the way, Charles will answer your question. <laughs> So plants have stem cells. In fact, what's amazing about plants is probably pretty well every cell in the plant can be a stem cell because if you do a simple experiment and just cut a bit of a plant off and, and put it in the right soil, often you'll get a completely new plant. So that tells you that there must be stem cells in most bits of the plant. Certainly stem cells seem to be very, very widely um, found throughout, obviously throughout animals and also in plants. Yeah. yeah, it's actually quite funny because it can't exist in single cellular life and multicellular evolve multiple times. Uh, like, Sorry, say that again? Uh, do those stem cells, do they have multiple or origins then? Multiple origins. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think you need to come and join us. <laughs> I think that's a great question and I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanking our two speakers very much for such a stimulating talk and also to thanking the audience for coming and for asking such a wide variety of really good questions. So thanks very much. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.